to uh, begin our Bible study. And uh, today I'm going to talk with you about the Holy Trinity. But before we begin, I'm going to ask if you would be kind enough to offer a word of prayer. Geraldine? Yes. Okay. Gracious God, how good it is to know you and to say your name, Jesus. It's just infilling, moving, transcendial. When we can call on you, Jesus, it's just something about that name, Jesus. It just takes us anywhere we want to go. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, as we celebrate this Advent and remember the birth of Jesus, your son, the ever-loving Christ, and reflect on the fact that one day he's coming back again, just like he said he would. For all of those who study the word, know the word, and are obedient to the word of God. Thank you for our household of faith, our pastor, his family, congregation, Scott, transformation. Thank you, God, for everything. And now, Lord, we await your presence. We look forward to dwelling among you. In the press, precious name of Jesus, the ever-loving Christ, we'll say amen. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you so very much, Dr. Jones. I really appreciate that beautiful prayer. As I shared with you uh, today, I want to talk with about the Holy Trinity and what does that mean for us as believers? What does that mean for us as Methodists? And it is important to know that we have what is called a book of discipline. And in that book of discipline, we have our polity, we have our doctrine, we have our general rules, we have very important information as to how to organize a church and how to sustain a church. But I want to focus specifically on the articles of religion, where there are 25 articles of religion that we subscribe to. Those articles of religion is our doctrinal standard of what we believe as Methodists, what we believe as Zion Methodists. And as we get into uh, this doctrine, it's also important that we pause to reflect upon the fact that our doctrine is scripturally sound. One of the things that I love about Methodism is that we are people who are scriptural, that we don't just simply deviate and just yield to our own carnality, our own wishes, our own ideas, but we do the very best we can to stay on center, to stay on message with the word of God, to rightly divide the word of truth, and to do it with sincerity, with humbleness, and humility. So looking at the article of religion, if you take a look at article religion number one, two, three, and four, that those first four articles deal with the Holy Trinity. And so let's get into article number one. It is called a faith in the Holy Trinity. And there's a lot of scriptures that are associated with this, and we'll get into that in just a moment. But I love what it says. It says, there is but one true living God, everlasting, without body or parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things visible and invisible. And in the unity of Godhead, in the unity of this Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Godhead. Now, I got to be honest with you. Uh, some years ago, when I was a uh, VICYC officer, that's going all the way back to the late 1990s. And 
as an officer, I was starting to get into the word of God. I answered the call to preach in 1997. I preached my trial sermon on December 31st, 1997. Uh, I wanted to know more about God. So I studied and studied and studied. And as I studied the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I learned that the gospels have so many similarities, but they have differences. And so as I studied it, I saw that there was a relationship between Christ and the Father. Christ would pray to the Father. Christ would talk with the Father. Christ would not make a move without the Father giving him permission. Christ said, not my will, but thy will shall be done. Christ wanted to make sure that he was always in alignment with God. And on one particular winter meeting in St. Louis, Missouri, as I was at uh, uh, this particular hotel, in our session with one of the bishops, it was Bishop Enoch B. Rochester, and he said emphatically that Christ and God the Father and the Holy Ghost are one. I thought that this was out of pocket. <laughs> I thought that this was wrong, and I stood up in front of all of these young people, and I said, Bishop, how can you say that the Trinity is of the Bible where I've never seen the word Trinity. I've never seen that Christ is God the Father and God the Father is Christ. I've never seen that the Holy Ghost is Christ and Christ is the Holy Ghost. It makes no sense to me because everything that I read tells me that Jesus is always submitting to the Father. And so that's when the bishop eloquently, so nicely said to me, he said, son, you can liken the Trinity to that of water. You see, water is of one substance, but you got three different characteristics of the water. He said, son, Water can be a solid, but it's still water. The solid is ice. Water can be a vapor. That's the mist. That's the steam, but it's still water. Water can be a liquid, but it's still the same essence. It's still one. And let me tell you, that thing will preach. But at that point in my life, I needed scriptural understanding. I needed to see for myself what the word of God said. What was I missing? And so I walked away. I walked away from that meeting with uh, Bishop Enoch B. Rochester with all of the youth. And some of the youth got mad with me because I was questioning the bishop. And I said to them, well, if I don't question, how am I ever going to find out? And mm -hmm. so they, they, they challenged me and Said, uh, Chandler, you wrong. You, you need to just sit back and learn and be quiet. I said, no, I, I, I can't be quiet because I've been studying this Bible and I need some understanding. And so guess what? That evening, God and I had it out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I went up to my room, my hotel room, and I started uh, talking with God openly. I was praying and, you know, my eyes are wide open. There's nobody in the room and I'm starting to talk to God and I'm saying, God, why is it that I don't know what I'm supposed to be preaching? I know that you called me and I believe that you called me into this thing. I believe that you called me to go out and tell people about the good news. But how can I go out and I don't know what I'm talking about? Why would you put me in this situation? Why would you embarrass me? God, I thought that you called me to this thing. And then I got animated. I got animated huh. with God. Shame. I know. I got upset with God. And all of a sudden, as I'm um, venting to God, I start talking about the devil. And then I start preaching in my room, telling the devil, if God tells me the truth about his gospel, he better watch out. I'm coming for him. I'm coming to tear down strongholds. I'm coming to break yokes. I'm coming for war. I'm coming for his blood. I'm coming to um, set the captives free. I'm telling you, I was going off. Well, that night, 
my life changed forever. That night, there was a victory night service and the Reverend Mark Anthony Thomas was preaching. I don't know what the man said. I don't remember his topic. I don't remember uh, what, what was happening. I do remember that young people were giving God praise. I saw that people were in celebration of what God was doing in that atmosphere, but I couldn't tune in. It was just, it was nothing but clashing symbols to me. It was just nothing but noise. And I was distraught because I didn't understand. And a man came to me and said, Reggie, you all right? And I said, yeah, I'm all right. He said, no, 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 something's wrong with you. You all right? And I said, man, I just don't understand the Trinity. That's when he said, Reggie, I'll be right back. He went and got his Bible and then sat me down and told me about the Trinity, went scripture to scripture. And after he went to scripture, that's when the tears started coming from my eyes. I lost it because at that moment, God had answered my prayer. I didn't know how he was going to answer my prayer. I didn't know when he was going to answer my prayer. I had begged God to teach me about the Holy Ghost. Teach me about Christ. Teach me about the Father. Teach me about the Godhead and how each one works for the good of humanity as well as the good of God. I needed to hear it. I needed to see it for myself. And when I received the revelation, I couldn't stop myself from crying. I couldn't stop myself from boo-hooing and, and apologizing to God and saying, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm just a wretch undone. Will you forgive me? But all of that was part of my process. That was part of my growth and development as a man of faith. Forget about being a preacher because I've learned that you know, God called me to preach, but before he called me to preach, he called me to believe in him and to trust him and to serve him. And so as we get into uh, this doctrine about the Holy Trinity, I'm going to share with you some scriptural references that helps to substantiate our claim that the Holy Trinity is something that we embrace as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. So when we get back to the article of religion, and let me tell you that the gentleman who talk, told me about the uh, Holy Trinity, he ain't even mentioned uh, the article of religion. He never mentioned that the first article, the number one article of what we believe as a doctrinal church is the Holy Trinity. He never said that. But as Methodists, every Methodist organization, whether it's United Methodist, AME, uh, UAME, whatever the case may be, every Methodist organization has the same articles of religion. Mm -hmm. And this is what we believe as a body of Christ. Let's go to um, Genesis chapter one. I need some readers tonight. I need y'all to participate with me. It's good to see you. Uh, Brother Lawson, how you doing? It's good to see the Howard family. Praise be unto God. Mm -hmm. Good to see you, Dr. J. Mm -hmm. Good to see you on the Zoom with us on tonight. I appreciate your presence. Can we get a reader for Genesis 1, chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3? And then I need a reader for um, 1 John, 1 John, chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. 1 John, Chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Dr. J? I you... have Genesis 1 1. All right, go for it. Genesis 1 in the beginning. I, uh, uh, I like this word. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, 
let there be light and there was light. So notice that with the phraseology of that first, those first few verses, God spoke a word into existence and something happened as a result. He spoke a word. He spoke a word. And it also says that his spirit was hovering. Yeah. The spirit of God, the, the Holy Ghost is mm -hmm. hovering. Mm -hmm. He speaks the word. He is the word. But let's look at Dr. Jones. You keep your finger right there. I need somebody else to take a look at John. I know we're going to go to first John in just a moment. But I need somebody to take a look at John chapter one. And I need you to read for me verses one, two, and three. Okay. Um, I have that one. Let's see. John chapter one, verses one, two, and three. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God mm. and the word was God. Mm. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. And that's right. one. So, so I want you to see the parallel between Genesis chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3, and look at the parallel of John chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now, this is interesting, and uh, Dr. Howard, we're going to come right back to uh, those moment but i need to tell you that out of all of the gospels you know you have your synoptic gospels which is matthew mark and luke and according to scholars they say that mark was the first gospel that was written and then came the apologia the apologia is what God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so we have the symbolism throughout our worship, but that's a whole nother conversation. Let's get back to John. So here we find that in the beginning was the word. The word that is being discussed is that which is in Genesis chapter number one, when God spoke the word, right? But then watch this. John says, not only was it in the beginning, but it is God himself. Wow, this is powerful, powerful, powerful messaging here that even as God is speaking forth the word, he's sending out the word. It is who he is. It is his essence. But then, uh, Dr. Howard, if you could take a look at verse number 14, skip on down to verse number 14 and read that for us. Okay, just a second. 14. Okay. 
So it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Mm. And we beheld his glory. The mm. glory as of the only begotten mm. of the Father. Mm-hmm. Full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. Wow. And the word became flesh yes, and man. dwelt among us. Who was that? Who are we talking about? <laughs> who who are we talk? Who is the word? Who <clears throat> is this referencing? Jesus. You got that right. <clears throat> Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word that is at the beginning. Jesus is the word that was spoke for. Jesus is the word now that becomes flesh and dwells among humanity. Amen. Hallelujah. God decided to speak the word, but then create the word by way of flesh so that we can be able to be fully present with him and he with us. That's why I get excited. We serve a God who is personable with each and every one of us. He's acquainted with us. He knows us and he spends time with us. He spends time with us in our humanity. Listen, um, you know, one thing about uh, one thing about experience. I will never be able to say that I have experienced childbirth. Oh. <laughs> okay, I, I, I leave that alone, Dr. Howard. I leave that alone, Brother Howard. I, I don't touch that. No, no, no. And not only do I, I don't touch that, but I have such a high respect for women who have given birth to a child because I've never experienced it. I can't say what it's like. Mm-hmm. I can't. I can't sympathize. I, I, I can try to sympathize. I can try to empathize, but I fall short. Mm-hmm. When a woman starts to have back pain, I don't understand that. When a woman's feet starts to swell, I don't understand that. When a woman starts to have all types of cravings, I don't understand that. When a woman has different mood swings, I don't understand that. When a woman feels hot when it's cold outside, I don't understand that. When a woman's face starts to swell up, I don't understand that. There are things I don't understand I've never experienced it. And so who am I to say to a woman who is with child what to do or how to tell a woman how to handle her own body? I need to mind my business. Tell the truth. I back up. I back up because I don't want to ever be out of pocket. But here we see that God wrapped himself in flesh. Mm dwelt among us and so now he understands what i go through Woo! Mm, he understands. and now 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 it begins to make sense why he forgives me so much why yeah. he has so much grace toward me why he has so much mercy toward you because he's been in your shoes He knows what it feels like to be abandoned. He knows what it feels like to be disrespected. He knows what it feels like to be put in a grave. He knows what it feels like to be smacked around. He knows what it feels like to be ridiculed and scorned. He knows what it feels like to be abandoned. He knows what it feels like to be betrayed. And yet the Lord forgives you. Mm. And he forgives me. Why? Because he understands. He understands what we go through. He understands. But he also he also knows that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 